So, um, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. Would you please talk a little bit about uh, where you were born uh, in your early life, your, your parents and your siblings? Uh, I was born right here in Indianapolis, Indiana, on the east side, 1923, and uh, I have a, a sister and a brother. My sister's name was Jean Douglas, my brother Joseph Douglas, and all three of us attended Purdue, graduated from Purdue. Great. Um, can you talk about what your your parents did for a living? My mother was a school teacher, and my dad uh, uh, worked in a foundry uh, here in town. And my mother was my mother stopped teaching for five years while the three of us were coming along, were born, and then she went back to work right after my brother was born. So she taught for about 45 years. My dad uh, and my mother divorced when, when I was about seven years old. And uh, this was during the Depression, right after, well, it wasn't right after, it was about 1931 when they divorced. <clears throat> and I was about eight or nine years old, years old. I was hit by a car, <coughs> and, uh, and my, my left leg was broken. The very next day after, um, I separated. And that's what has really changed my life. Turned me around in a certain respect. Because I, I lost a whole year of school. I was in the hospital for about six months. Oh, my goodness. Because... Um, the break didn't heal correctly, so they uh, rebroke it twice in the hospital. Oh my gosh, was that painful? Well, no, I was asleep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was painful psychologically because mm -hmm. the doctor didn't seem to care that I heard them talking. Oh. He said they were standing all around the bed about five or six times. I said, we'll have to rebreak it. And this, this killed me. I'm, I'm just a child, you know. I'm just about nine years old. And it was very traumatic just to hear that. And also, I had to go through all those operations alone. This was depression time. My parents couldn't, couldn't come to the hospital to, to be with me during this time. And so I went through all those uh, operations alone, and it was... It had quite a quite an effect on my life. Oh my goodness! Yeah. I learned I learned to pray, mm -hmm. and I also learned never to give up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the uh, parents also were unable to come during visiting hours. They had a crazy idea about visiting hours because uh, in, in this hospital they had a children's ward. Visiting hours were from 2.30 to 3.30, something like that. My parents couldn't get there. They didn't need their job, so I was alone there also. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I went into all this. I wasn't supposed to be talking about all this. No, no. Could you remember which hospital? It was uh, General, it was called City Hospital. Now it's... In the main hospital here, and I can't think of the name. It's named it for a doctor. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll come across my mind a little later. It was City Hospital when I was there. Okay. And they had an entire ward um, dedicated to children only, where I was for six months in bed. Learn how to really pray. 
But I wasn't supposed to be talking about all this. I was supposed to be telling you something else. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, it's all about your life. And that's a, obviously had a great impact on your life. It did. And uh, I missed, oh, another thing, I missed a whole semester of school. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> when I got out during the summer, and let's see, um, I think I got hit in February, and I didn't get out till about July, sometime like that, that of 1932, I think it was. At any rate, I'd missed that whole semester of school. And so when the next semester started, it was decided to, to pass me on just as if I had had that semester because my sister was right behind me. Mm-hmm. And they didn't want, they wanted to keep me, keep us separated more or less by letting me go forward. So I missed that semester, but I went on into the uh, third grade 3B without having gone, went on to the 3A without having gone to the 3B, one of those things. <clears throat> and um, so that kept me still a year ahead of my sister, and uh, we ended up that way. So what am I supposed to be telling you now? Well, would you uh, want to talk a little bit about um, your high school years? A- any memorable teachers? Um, favorite classes? Your just your general interests, like during high school. I was interested in science all my life, and so I took a lot of. I entered Bishop Saddock High School in um, uh, September 1937. And actually, my mother began teaching there that same time. And uh, it was kind of strange, because I had been in her uh, class in the the lower grades, in the third grade at one point, and I didn't like it too well. Hmm. But uh, there she was. She was was teaching music now in in high school. She went in in 1937, the same time I went to Attic's. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I had a lot of very good teachers. Um, maybe you've heard of John Morton Finney. He was Dr. John Morton Finney. He was a great uh, man that a lot of people know about. He lived to be about 107. Oh. He worked, he taught till he was in his 80s, I believe. And, uh, and there was, in, his, in a class, he taught language I was in his homeroom at one time, but never was in any class of his. But um, I was mostly interested in science, and one of my favorite teachers there was Dr. Ch- was uh, Mr. Charles Harry, who taught zoology. Oh, that's interesting. I was only one semester thing, but I really enjoyed being in his class. And also, I like to participate in music. When I was in grade school. Um, Mr. Laverne Newsom would come over from the high school and would uh, ask around for people who like to to learn to play an instrument. And so I asked my mother to get to buy me a cello, and she got that. And Mr. Newsom would come over to our school and uh, give us lessons once a week. So he was very important to me in that respect. So when I got to high school, I, was, I played in the high school orchestra for three years. The fourth year, I was taking too many subjects. I took six solids, uh, and I didn't have time for orchestra. I did have the time. I had one period that I could have taken orchestra, but the principal said, no, you have to have a lunch hour. It's <laughs> 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 important to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't take orchestra my last semester, but that was one of the things I really, I really did like playing the cello. And so when I went to Purdue, I also got into the symphony orchestra there. But we'll go into that later. So, other than the orchestra in high school, did you belong to any other student type organizations? Was there a science club or anything like that? Yes, I was at a science club, and. 
I was also interested in athletics, but my leg wouldn't allow me to do the things I wanted to do, so I didn't get into basketball, didn't get into track or any of those things, but, but I was interested in it. I was always doing it on my own, but I didn't get to participate as a, as a high school student. Um, I didn't like English for some reason or other. Now, we always spoke very good English in our home, and I didn't think uh, studying English was so important. I think I, I really um, caused myself a lot of problems along that line because I didn't, I re didn't really try to study it very much. And when I got to Purdue, I had trouble in my first semester English class, but I, I did finally pass it. Good. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a P <laughs> <laughs> for passing. All right. So, what what led you to choose Purdue uh, for college? I like I said, I was interested in athletics, and I listened to the radio. We had a radio in those days. Purdue uh, that Purdue football was broadcast. I remember one game Purdue. Played Notre Dame. Notre Dame either was that year a national champion or had been a national champion. And it may have been 1936, I don't know. But in the, in the Purdue's backfield, they had Brock, Brown, and Violene. And they gave Notre Dame all they could handle. And I think Notre Dame finally won the game about 14 to 10, something like that. But Purdue gave such a good battle, I said, I'd like to go to that school. That was one of the determining things that had me go there, plus the fact that I knew they had a good science school, school of science. So those were two determining factors for me going to Purdue. Uh, if you could, you might be able to look up and see what year they had the uh, backfield of Brock, Brown, and Violin. Oh. And yes. they played Notre Dame, and I don't remember the the, the year. But I do remember that uh, the backfield, some of the people in the backfield for Notre Dame were um, Steve Sitko, Stevens, and I think there was somebody named Bagow, but I'm not sure about that last name. There was one name I keep forgetting. It's very important in football. I think the uh, either the son or the grandson this person is now a uh, coach at Alabama. Think of his name. This, this man was in the backfield with, with Steve Sitko. Anyway, Purdue played so well in that game, I said, I'd like to go to that school. <laughs> All right. So those are the two determining factors, actually. So um, you, you get to campus. Uh, what were some classes or professors that uh, made an impact on you at Purdue? Well, let's see. Like I say, I, I tried out for the, the orchestra, mm -hmm. and I was accepted, although I wasn't that much of a good player, but I, I, play, I had the cello with me, and I tried out, and I was accepted in the orchestra. I think I was the first African-American ever to play in the Purdue uh, Symphony Orchestra. Um, can't think of. Uh, there was a Professor Graves that I became acquainted with, but I was never in his class. I, I went to the freshman camp that year, and I met Professor Graves there, and uh, he, he he impressed me very much. Later on, when my sister went there, she she stayed at his house. Uh, on the campus, of, near the campus at one time. Uh, I was, um, I stayed over in Lafayette because there was no place in West Lafayette for us at that time. We couldn't stay in, I couldn't stay in Cary Hall. They didn't have any uh, place for African Americans on the campus. So a man named Alex Walker living over in Lafayette who took students, and I think three of us were there, three or four of us stayed there. And we took the bus back and forth, and sometimes I'd even walk 
back and forth across the river uh, to get to and from school. Uh, and I don't remember any real strong professors right now. Of course, I like to say I was never in Dr. Graves' uh, class. I think he was a math teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't remember any, any professors. Uh, I attended the, um, the Presbyterian Church there. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed by pastor at that time, he was an elderly man, and he uh, designed a couple of his sermons around African Americans, and he asked me how I felt about that, and I said, well, I guess that's all right, but I don't know if anybody appreciates it, <laughs> anybody else appreciates it, because everybody else in the audience was white. Oh. My brother came, he joined the church, and he became an elder there, in the Presbyterian Church there on the campus. Well, you've, you've touched on this a little bit by saying that you had to live in Lafayette. Uh, what was the reception of the um, other white students to African American students? Was there any overt discrimination? The students didn't seem to be discriminatory uh, any overtly, but uh, it was a, un, sort of an undercurrent. And, uh, I never had any trouble anywhere except on the basketball court. Uh, one time we were just a little pickup game we were playing over there in the field house, and I accidentally bumped the guy that I was guarding. And he didn't like it, and he started calling me all sorts of names going to hit me with the ball, and the other guy stopped him. But I never had anything other than that to happen. Uh, most everybody was friendly. Um, I do remember this. Uh, the organizations had a, had a get-together at one time. All the people from the choirs and the, the orchestra got together for this little party. They had the girls in a, in a circle and the boys in an outer circle. Mm -hmm. when, as, as the piano played, we walked around in different directions. When the piano stopped, you were supposed to have dinner with the person standing in front of you. Well, if the piano, the music stopped, and lo and behold, sitting, standing right in front of me was my sister. Oh! She was, <laughs> she played, uh, violin in the arc. So this must have been in 1942, guess when she came in to do. So they decided they'd play it again. They played again, and the next time the music stopped, she and George Hudson were facing one another. George Hudson was an African American who sang in the choir. There were just three of us in the whole organization of about 200 people. And so, uh, it was very manipulative that they tried to get Get us together like that. Mm -hmm. So the girl that finally, finally ended up with, we had we had dinner together. We talked. We had a very nice time together. He and, and uh, George were together. So it was it was manipulated and uh, very noticeably to us anyway. What about your experiences around West Lafayette and Lafayette, the townspeople? Uh, didn't have much to do in town in those days. Uh, I ate at the Union Building, and uh, I didn't have to get groceries or anything. And, uh, spent most of my time at the Union when I lived across the river until time to go back home. But, uh, townspeople, I don't, I don't really I just had to ride the bus, and there was no real problem there on the buses. 
No, nobody really caused any real problem that I can remember. But I knew that uh, Purdue was discriminating against us. We couldn't live. I couldn't live in Cary Hall. Mm-hmm. I never even saw Cary Hall. Never even went over there. I didn't want to see it. We were. We were uh, sort of put in a little group of, of our own. They did have a social action group at one time, and we attended and uh, brought up a number of issues that Purdue could could address. Several of the several Jewish people students came in; they had some issues. The uh, there was there was a professor there. I guess he was a the uh, deans, something or other, are supposed to take these, take and take, give us answers from the, the top. I don't know whether they have the answers. Uh, social action. Oh. Hello. Hello. Okay. It seemed like we lost the signal for a second. No, I'm I'm trying to dig. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My memory is. This is coming to me the way I am coming and flowing like it should. I don't know whether I've answered your question or not. Oh, yeah, you sure did. Um, did you have any uh, favorite courses while you were at Purdue? I, uh, let's see, favorite course. Well, I can say this. I had four years of, of PE. Oh, <laughs> because when when I arrived in forty one, they were not allowing African Americans to take military training there. The, the ROTC was was were not we were not allowed to take ROTC. Oh no! And uh, I guess they didn't want any black officers. So when the war started, uh, Purdue changed its policy. And it surprised me. I was walking around one day, and I saw some freshman guys come on and say, what are you guys doing with um, in ROTC uniforms? So evidently they changed their, their policy after the start of World War II. And everybody was allowed to take ROTC, but I never, I, never was, I never took it in the years I was there. I was always put in a PE, uh, physical ed class. What was the question? <laughs> oh, if if you had a favorite course. Oh. Yeah. Well, I guess the science was my. I think chemistry. I did appreciate. Uh, I liked. I liked being in chemistry classes. And, uh, there was one one lab that I liked in particular. Uh, I was. Paired up. This was this was after the war. I was paired up with a white girl, which was kind of unusual. Her name was Lorna Dunmeyer. They called her Pinky. Hmm. We got along very well, and uh, so that that class was uh, stands out in my memory. The chemistry class. I was. I was older than most of the students there, a little bit older, because I had been uh, in the military. I had been out of school. I left Purdue in uh, January of 44 and didn't get back till September of 46. I was in the, mil- I was in the military most of that time. Chemistry, the chemistry class was... Uh, Several chemistry classes were such as like. Well, would you want to talk a little bit a little bit about your time in the army? Uh, we know I was drafted. Um, DC 
December of 43, and I was supposed to, to go into active service uh, January the 15th of 44. And my, when my, I told my mother about it, she went down and, and got me a little extra time to finish out that semester. She said, you're so close to the end of the semester, um, try to get you enough, just enough time to finish it up. And so they gave me 15 more days uh, to finish the semester. I got full credit for the semester. So oh, great. I had the, let's see, January the 31st, I ended my college work and February the 1st, 7 o'clock in the morning, I got on the train to Indianapolis and then took the bus to Fort Bender and Harrison. I was in the Army. Didn't have time to, to go home and take my clothes or books or bicycle. My brother and sister had to do that at the end of the semester. I didn't have any time at all. I had to go right from school on the 31st of January. Um, yeah, the 31st of uh, January, uh, the first of February, had to be had to be out at Fort Harrison by noon, and I was at Fort Harrison for about a month and a half. There so long, they gave me a job, uh, bringing in new recruits and uh, and taking them around to get their various tests, shots, and so forth. Finally, they got a bunch of us together, and. Um, Found out I was in the Army Air Force. Went to Keesler Field, Biloxi, Mississippi, where we took 30-day basic training. Mississippi at that time was a dangerous place to be. It was almost like being uh, overseas under fire. Mm. The, uh, the uh, attitude of the, the citizens there was pretty bad, and we were not allowed to go to town. <clears throat> because of that, <clears throat> we we did go. We were allowed to go to one little little shack where they stole some beer and stuff. And I wasn't. It, I didn't drink. Mm -hmm. I just went there one time to see what it was all about. It's just a little place where they sold stuff, to drink, and so forth. I came on back to camp. Uh, so things are pretty rough in Mississippi. We were, when we were leaving, we had our vouchers and we had to go down to the train station to, to turn these vouchers in to get tickets to, to come up north. We went in the train station, the man said, you, you can't get your ticket here, you have to go around to the outside. So we walked around to the outside, the same ticket man, the same ticket, ticket, uh, get the same tickets, but we had to get ours on the outside window. So we got our tickets, and a buddy of mine from Indianapolis decided we'd walk around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Bad idea. Uh-oh. So we, we were walking down the street, and we approached a couple, young man and, young man and woman, white, and we kind of moved over so they could get by and we could get by. This little guy, he got so mad, he was hopping mad about something about us on the street. We didn't really know... You know, we were from the north. We didn't know what we were, whether we were supposed to jump off the curb or what we were supposed to do. We just kept on walking. And I said, that guy, if he had been with another man, there might have been a fight, but he was with this woman, and he knew he couldn't take both of us. Mm -hmm. So he didn't do anything but get mad and jump up and down and act silly. So we decided we better go back to the train station and wait on the train. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's terrible, though. <laughs> We, we had heard stories about uh, bad things happening in Mississippi, so we said, we better just go on back here and wait. So we took the train on up uh, to Ellen Inn, went up as far as, um, I think it stopped at Nashville, Ten no, Louisville, Kentucky. Got off the train, and everybody disappeared, and I heard some guys saying, hey, hey. I looked over there, and there was a big sign that said, Colored Waiting Room. I said, I'm not going in there. He said, man, you better come on in here. They were all jammed in there. I didn't go. 
I sat out of the main waiting room and waited on the next trade. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's 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 pretty brave back then. Yeah, nothing happened. I said I'm not going in there. And then um, we went to we were sent to uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Randall Field. We stayed there a couple of months. We had been hot down in Mississippi, and it was cold in Wisconsin. Matter of fact, we we marched in a July Fourth parade, and we nearly froze. Oh no! I never <laughs> so cold in my life. <laughs> so we we only stayed in Wisconsin a, about a month or so, and then we were sent to Greensboro, North Carolina, for overseas training, and um, that was a nice place. And I never saw so many. Negroes in all my life. We'd go into town on Saturday night. Down on Market Street, you couldn't walk on the sidewalks. You had to walk on the street. It was even crowded out there. Only only buses would come through every now and then. Just people, just soldiers everywhere. Finally got through that train and we went to uh, uh, finished our overseas training. Went to Fort Patrick Henry stayed there and waited on time when we were in a taxi to get on the boat overseas. And we didn't know where we were going. We took this boat to General Billy Mitchell out of New York. It seemed that this, this particular boat was being transferred to the Pacific Fleet, from the Atlantic to the Pacific Fleet. But we took it. They took us around, down around through the Panama Canal, and that was very interesting. It took 24 hours to get through the canal. I watched every bit of it, going up through, through the up docks, then through the down docks, onto the Pacific. We had one um, uh, escort ship, which had a lot of armament on it, guns and everything for our protection. And it, it escorted us all the way to Australia. Of course, we didn't know we were going there, but we, that's where we ended up. In Australia, they port in Australia for about thirty, about three days, and then we took off again. And our next stop was Ceylon, uh, Columbus, Ceylon. We stayed there a couple of days. And then we got to our final destination, which was Bombay, India. And uh, got off the boat. I had never been seasick, but I got land sick. Oh. It didn't last long, but, you know, you get used to it. We've been on this boat more than a month, and uh, just felt it going up and down, up and down all the time. When I got on land, the land didn't move. And it, it uh, <laughs> I've been accustomed to the boat moving and the land didn't move. It made a difference. Yeah. I got sick for a little bit, but it wasn't very bad. We stayed at a British camp there for about two weeks. And then we took a train... It was four days to go across the subcontinent of India from Bombay to Calcutta. And this was very interesting. We saw all kinds of things. Beautiful people, very poor people, poverty is chicken. But there's one thing about it. Uh, India had been having a lot of deaths from hunger every year up to 1944, but after that they didn't have any more. I don't know whether the presence of the Americans had anything to do with it or not, but um, Gandhi was still alive. Mm -hmm. We never saw him, but we had a lot of, lot of experiences with other Indians. When we finally got to Calcutta, we were able to move around a little bit, and then we took a plane from Calcutta up to the northeastern part of India, very up to up to where the um, Burma Road kind of dips into India and then heads toward China. We were there at the, around the banks of the Brahma Future River, which is part of the Ganges system, and the little town was Tezpur. And we were at the 1327th base unit, Air Force Base Unit, Tezpur, India. 
And we, we were, our job was to supply the flying tigers, what had been the flying tigers over in China, with uh, whatever they needed, gasoline, parts, different things like that. And um, my first job was with a gang that loaded gasoline barrels onto airplanes that would fly over the hump, over the Himalayas to Kunming, China. I finally, I got injured one day. We were, uh, had a truckload of 55 gallon gasoline drums head toward the plane we were going to. The airplane turned out of <clears throat> a warm up circle and headed toward us. <clears throat> At that moment, I didn't see it. I had my back toward the direction we were traveling. I was putting on my gloves, and the, the driver of the truck that I was in jammed on his brakes <clears throat> when he saw this airplane turn out towards us. I didn't see any of this, and I flew over the, I was thrown out of the uh, back of this truck over the cab and down on the ground, oh. and <clears throat> lit on my head and right shoulder. <clears throat> I was stunned. I couldn't move, but I heard him changing his gears. The guy riding shotgun said, don't move, don't move, he's right under your wheel. And mm -hmm. I would have been as he would turn to, to back up. Mm -hmm. He didn't move, but <clears throat> they had to send for an ambulance and pick me up, and my back was hurt. This this airplane had to stand there all the time. It took about 15 or 20 minutes to do all this. Or I don't know what happened after that, but I was out of commission for about two and a half months because I couldn't I could just barely walk, just creep along, because every little jar would hurt. Luckily, I haven't had any back trouble since that cleared up. It took about two or three months for me to, to be able to walk properly. I remember one day when I was, um, I decided, uh, I was up on my feet, I decided I was going to walk down to the outdoor theater, which is about a half a mile from where we were. And the <clears throat> officer came by in a jeep and he saw me kind of crippling along and he offered me a ride. This jeep went over those bumps and nearly tore me up. Oh, no. <laughs> to get out of the <laughs> I thanked the officer. <laughs> but I was glad to get out of there. <laughs> so I was finally put back on duty, and I couldn't, I really couldn't do it. So they made me a night CQ. Well, I was alert officers for flights when they when their planes were ready and so forth. And then uh, after that, I was... Um, given another job working in the field hospital because I had had some, some laboratory training at Purdue. I was giving these shots and drawing blood and doing whatever the doctors asked me to do. It was very interesting to, to be there. So uh, on August the 14th, finally, the, the war with Japan was over. And... Uh, We were getting ready to come home. It took us about four or five months to, to get out of there. They burned a lot of equipment. Everything I had that I could give away, I gave away to the Indians because they didn't have anything. I had a pair of civilian shoes that everybody liked, loafers. I gave those to the Indian boy that worked in the tent and sheets and blankets and whatever I had that I could give away. Then it took us another, like I say, three or four months to really get to the... They took us to Karachi to take the ship home. But in the meantime, we were on this desert outside Karachi, a big Indian desert. And this camp located was designed to be in a circle. And not only is it very disturbing or very easy to get lost in a desert, mm. The way the camp was set up, I got lost every time. Oh, no. I was <laughs> have to ask somebody where my unit was because I couldn't mm -hmm. find it. If I ever went to town, I'd have trouble getting back home, back to my tent. Anyway, we finally uh, got on the ship. I don't even remember the name of the ship going home. I was sort of in a daze. And we, we went back, sort of a, went back about the same way back to the Pacific to get back home. We stopped in Singapore, 
stayed there a couple of days, and we also stopped at um, Manila, and and when we left the Philippines, we were supposed to stop at the Hawaiian Islands on the way back, but there was a storm in the area, and so we by- bypassed Hawaii and came on into San Francisco. And that was my the extent of my uh, Army experience. Was your unit fairly integrated, or were you still separated? We were all separated. <clears throat> Integration didn't happen until 1948, and uh, <clears throat> we were still Army Air Force, and then finally the Air Force and the Army separated also. So you just have the, you have the Air Force, and no more Army Air Force. But, uh, we, we had to work together uh, with there were bunch of white troops there. Uh, as a matter of fact, our first out with them was a little, a little bit of trouble. Uh, went down to the, the outdoor theater, <clears throat> and the N-word began to be passed around. And uh, some of the boys took care of that right away. And a uh, little dust up there, and after that, it wasn't heard anymore. We let them, they let them know right away that we weren't going to stand for that N-word at all. All right. And, uh, didn't happen again either. But that was a little something that just, just happened. We, we worked together very well, really. But I was happy to hear that the, you know, there was, uh, in 48, that the services were integrating. It didn't happen all at once. I know. It didn't it probably wasn't an easy thing, but I wasn't in the service at that time, but just to have the the order to come out meant a lot to me. It should be integrated. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of bad things happen when you're when you're separate. One one of the things was that, that we didn't have any uh, Almost everybody in our outfit were privates and PFCs. We didn't have any any higher grades around. Uh, it's called now, but <clears throat> in in any other organization, they'd have a lot of sergeants and and uh, so forth. But we didn't have any of that. We had very low grade. I got as high as PFC. <clears throat> I wasn't really worried about it. I just wanted to get get it over and get home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And back to school. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I did go back to school in uh, September of 1946, and I graduated in uh, June of 47. And uh, lucky enough to get a job in October of that same year. And I stayed on that job for 65 years. I've just been off, left the state employment back in October of this year. Uh, pardon me, October of last year. October of uh, 2012, which meant I was on the job for 65 years, which was the longest of any state employee so far. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. What uh, what brought you to the Department of Health? Um, did you look around at, at leaving Indiana for work, or did you want to stay in Indiana? I wanted to stay. I'm not a person who wanted to go anywhere, really, but um, I had applied to several places, and uh, nothing came up. But there was a young lady who had been writing, we have been writing back and forth while I was in the service. She, went, she was going to Indiana University. And she was taking a class in um, laboratory technology. And they would come up to Indianapolis uh, about every week to study with uh, Dr. Louis Mazzini, who was at the Indiana State Board of Health Laboratories. And of course, she was the author of the Mazzini test syphilis, and uh, he had done some other work, and they would come up to study with him. While they were there, Dr. Damon from the, the laboratory was 
uh, he was head of the laboratory, came in to try to recruit from the class, and he said uh, he gave them a lot of information about who to see and all that, and she told me about that, and I said, I asked her to get names, addresses, telephone numbers, locations, and all that, so I might see if I could get a job. And she did that, and uh, I took it all down, and uh, as soon as I could, I, I made a telephone call to the Department of Health, it was called Board of Health then, and uh, I asked the lady, did they have any openings? She said, oh yes, we have openings in serology and uh, water lab and this, that, and the other, a whole bunch of things. They were just, they were building up, retooling for some reason or other. And uh, she said, come on over and talk to Dr. Damon. And I said, thank you. And went over that same day. When I got there, uh, I presented myself, and, and I said, I understand that you have some openings. And she said, oh, no, we don't have anything. And I started to walk away, and I said, no, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to see this out. Mm -hmm. I came back, and I said, I talked to you on the phone not long, about an hour ago, and you said you had openings, and I could see Dr. Damon. She said, oh, 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 in that case, have a seat. Dr. Damon will be right back. He's not in right now. Sure enough, he, he came back, he was in, he came in, and uh, he wanted to hire me right away. Oh. However, he gave me a tour of the building, and one of the places he took me was where they did glassware and, and so forth, and everything by hand. They had to wash all this stuff by hand, dig out TV bottles with, by hand and all that. And, and so he said... Uh, offered me this job, called me up on the phone the next day and offered me the job to be a head of that division. All Negroes working in there. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I, re I refuse that job. I said, I must be crazy, but I just didn't like that setup. Yeah. So a couple of weeks later, he called me back and he said, how would you like to work in serology? Said, fine, fine, I said, did a little some serology at Purdue did very well, so I was hired um, uh, Could you um, explain what serology is? It is the study of uh, blood and serum uh, the doing tests with blood and serum, I should say that uh, and back in those days syphilis was the big thing you had to have a test for syphilis to get married, to get a job, to do almost anything. You had to have a test for syphilis. And so uh, the Board of the Department of Health was, was really uh, uh, had had a lot of work to do in, in that area. I think they would test 3,000 specimens uh, about every other day. That's a lot of work. Yeah, sounds like it. Very busy. Since then, they're not requiring syphilis tests for marriage and all that, and they, they uh, syphilis is not, I mean, it's so easily treated nowadays, it's really not a, a problem, like uh, HIV, and, uh, and those things are now, so things have changed, but uh, virology still goes on. So... Anyway, I stayed in serology for about 30 years, and then I was shifted over to the rabies lab. And stayed for a long time. Last assignment was in the uh, dairy lab. I was there a number of months before my retirement. I stayed in the same agency, but different departments of that agency for 65 years. You must have made a lot of good friends. I had friends, and there were enemies, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that happens, yes. <laughs> I was known by everybody. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the enemies couldn't do me any harm, because I believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Jesus, my protection, and uh, the Holy Spirit, my protection. Uh, what made you finally decide to retire? 
It was kind of decided for me. Um, uh, my work, I might say my work was was not up to par uh, near the end. Um, a lot of it had to do with my physical abilities and my eyesight, and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Age. Age was coming on me, 89 years old, so it was kind of decided for me, and it was hard for me to take first, but uh, time goes on and things happen, and then you have to, have to take it as it goes, as it is. So they gave me a big send-off, which I paid for monetarily. <laughs> 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 but it was it was very good. Everybody, uh, everybody knew me, and everybody came to that um, celebration and wished me well. Now I'm volunteering uh, at at the war memorial, which is very nice. And I had to think back about my war experiences, and I talked to groups of children, grade school children, and uh, they, they seem to appreciate it very much. They always, at the end, they always say, thank you for your service, and stuff like that. So uh, little, little children are very, uh, very nice to me. Oh, that's wonderful. So um, w when you came back from the war and you, you finished school, you got a job, did you um, end up getting married? Yes, I, I worked. I went to work in October of uh, forty-seven. Didn't get married till June of nineteen fifty-two. And in the marriage, we had two children. Um, I worked hard. I got the house paid for in about seven and a half years. So. That was taken care of, but my wife and I divorced after about oh, 14 years, 66, we got a divorce. Always uh, maintained my relations with the, the children. I was over there every day during the week to see about their homework and Help them out of whatever I could. Help them, help them in every way that I could. And when they left high school, um, my daughter got a scholarship to Brown University. It turned out to be a four-year scholarship. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, uh, I drove her there and back every every year. Uh, I didn't have money enough, and I didn't really want to buy her a car, so we, the whole family would drive. She, uh, she graduated from Brown, and then she got a scholarship to Yale. She got a, got a master's degree from Yale. Wow, you must be very proud. In the meantime, my son decided he wanted to go into uh, astronomy, so he decided to go to the University of Arizona. So there was a couple of times when I had to drive from Indianapolis to Providence, Rhode Island, and back, and then to Tucson, Arizona, and back. And one year, um, I had a 67 Oldsmobile convertible, good car, but I bought it when I was four years old, and I bought it. And I decided to take the car and recondition it, put it back together, but I didn't get it put back together the year that she graduated from Brown, and so I had to borrow, I had to rent a car. I rented this car, and I took it back, uh, uh, and in a week's time, I had put 6,000 miles on it. Oh my goodness. And the manager said, what in the world have you been doing? <laughs> I was running dope or something, but I told him what it was. <laughs> One, Almost from one from the east coast, almost to the west coast and back, 
and fixed it nearly 6,000 miles. Of course, I didn't have to pay for mileage. I just had to pay for the time that I had it. But when I had when I was driving my own car, I didn't think too much about it, about the mileage. But then uh, my son decided he'd rather fly uh, in the last couple of years, so I didn't have to drive to Arizona anymore. And uh, my daughter got a job, and she graduated from Yale. She got a job there in, in uh, the city with Yale. Oh, she got a job there, very, very good position. Then she got married, so my daughter never really came back home. Oh, wow. So I kind of, I kind of felt that uh, uh, I'd like to have her around, but now she's living in Atlanta. She has, they, have, they, have, they, have, they have graduated from college now. My son is never married, and I really... Feel bad about that. I think he needs. I know he needs. That's the way the family is. How many grandchildren do you have? My daughter has two sons. Just those two, mm-hmm. and they're not married. They both. They both had birthdays in June, and I. I sent them birthday cards and and so forth, and uh, they're getting up there. One is. Just about then, one is 30 years old, the other is uh, 26. So they both ought to be married, but they're not. And they don't have jobs yet. Oh, no. Jobs are hard to find, even for college graduates, maybe even harder for college graduates. That's true. That's true these days. It's been very hard. So, but their dad's a doctor, and... I kind of put some of that on my daughter, and uh, I said, "Let those boys volunteer at the hospital." She said, "No, there's so many diseases at the hospital. You can't. <laughs> these kids are grown men. These guys, they can take care of themselves." Mm-hmm. He's, he's, one of these mothers are just holding back, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if these boys, they could go right along to the hospital with their dad, and and be doing something constructive. She hadn't allowed them to go. My mother was all together. My mother was always pushing me out to get jobs when I was in high school. Mm-hmm. So forth. I had to, in the summer. I'd put an ad in the paper, and uh, I'd get jobs cutting grass and working in people's houses. I remember one job that I had one summer. A lady asked me, if I was I a Butler University student?" I said, "No, I'm just high school." And she had me dig this garden. She wanted me to say, now I want you to dig it at least a foot deep. Big old garden. I had to dig it all. I dug all day and for 75 cents. Oh, my goodness. And lunch. <laughs> 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 I mean, I was a guy when I got to that. But my mother always kept me going on some kind of job and we also, my brother and I also carried papers, carried the Indianapolis News uh, for a couple of years in high school. So we were always doing something. I carried ice at one time, worked at the ice house. Did. Worked at a grocery store. All this before college. Did you have um, any jobs during college? At Purdue? No. Um, I'd saved up some money, and for the first year, I was able to pay my tuition and books, and my parents paid for my room and board. I didn't have a job in college. I had a job every summer, and uh, the last summer that my brother and I were able to spend together was 1946. And I was just out in um, service. He had been, he had um, gotten his wings at Tuskegee. Oh, wow. At the time he went in, the war was just about over. And when he got his wings, 
the war was just over, and he was discharged immediately. So he went back to went back to Purdue right away, and nearly caught up with me. I'm three years older than he is. But anyway, in '46, we were both out, and uh, we we ride out. We knew, lived near we lived, we lived near the um, Indianapolis and the Nashville, which was had a different name at that time, but. We'd ride our bicycles over there, and we'd rent a plane. We'd fly over to Indianapolis, did that a couple, two or three times, and we had a lot of fun that summer. As uh, He was checked out in a small plane, and, and uh, we could fly any time we wanted to, because he, he had a private private pilot's license by that time. But uh, after 46, we weren't... Uh, didn't have time together. I was back in school, and he was back in school. And then he got a job in '48 and went to Washington D.C. He was the first African American to work in C. N. Washington. Wow. And, uh, he got married in '50. He had four children. So he and I just never got back together. Again. This was here in town, but she got married before any of us did. And she graduated before anybody did, and she had four, three or four children, four children. And so I was by myself. My mother wanted me to get married, and I didn't want to leave home. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't a very adventurous guy. I even forgot the question. I rambled on, so... No, no, they're really... It, it, it's great. It's wonderful hearing about your life. Um, besides volunteering at the War Memorial, uh, how else are you uh, keeping busy? Well, there's a lot to do around here. Um, I live alone, and this house has been neglected for never for many years. I mean, working every day is great, but... You don't have a lot of time to do any house, a lot of housework and all that. So uh, that's true. I'm the kind of guy who would not take off to do that. I wouldn't. I always would rather go to work than to to play sick or, or take off when I was supposed to or something like that. So I've been trying to get the house back in order, and I have a house across the street where it was our, our original family home, and I'm trying to keep that up. So. Between that and the War Memorial, going to church on Sundays, go to Bible school on Wednesdays, mm -hmm. just doing the ordinary things of life, it keep me quite busy. All right. Well, um, is there anything that we did not discuss that we that you would like to talk about? Well, and there's one thing I thought about while I was at Purdue. We had a we had a, a quartet that we organized at Purdue, and we called ourselves the Plantation Boys. Oh my goodness! My mother hated that day. <laughs> I don't know why she chose it. <laughs> yeah. we chose that name, and um, it was made up of uh, Cortez Kibble, George Hudson. Those two were both from. New Jersey, Nicholas Hood from Terre Haute, Indiana, and myself. And we sang on WBAA a number of times. We also participated in some of the um, things that uh, the university put on at the, in the Hall of Music. And uh, we, all, we sang without accompaniment, but we did have a young lady to help us, a young lady by the name of Betty Jean Tanner, would give us the uh, hit a note on the piano, which would give us the start for what we were going to sing. She didn't play the piano, but she could play, hit the note that we wanted, so, so the plantation boys could sing. So we didn't last very long because something happened. I don't know whether the war, whether the war came along or what it was that, that broke us up, that stopped us, but. Um, we, we thought we were pretty good stuff. We, we sang mostly church, church songs. But 
that was uh, that was something I really wanted to mention. Yeah. Um, would that be your favorite memory of Purdue? No, I don't think that's my favorite. I don't know. Um, uh, favorite. Um, uh, I, I can't th really think of it. I think one of my one of my favorite things was we, when I finally was able to live over on the campus. I lived at International House. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not. Mm -hmm. There was a co-op house designed to house one-third white, one-third African-American, and one-third foreign students. And uh, the house lasted for a number of years. It's not in opera. I don't think it's in operation now because they've even torn that house down. It was at, on the corner of one, it was one University Street, right across from the... Uh, Homec building, okay. and and across the street from the A campus. So um, I think that living there was was a very good experience for everybody. Uh, we got along very well. We'd have bull sessions and talk stuff out. And, and, uh, it, was, it was just a good experience all around. Well, are there any other topics you would like to return to? Oh, I can't think of anything. Um, I cannot think of anything. But I wish you would uh, look up that football game that I was thinking about between in, between Purdue and Notre Dame, if you can look up the people who played in the backfield, uh, might uh, would give you a clue as to when that game was played and so forth. Okay. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, probably around 1936. I don't think I was in high school yet. But uh, that was one of the things that, that gave me made me interested in going to Purdue because they fought so well, so well against Purdue and they were definitely the underdogs uh, playing against Notre Dame. That really made an impact on you. It did. It did. And, and um, a little simple thing like that <laughs> can, can, can have its importance yeah, I mean, it, it helped you uh, shape the course of, you know, of, of your life by, by heading on to Purdue. Mm -hmm. I also had a pretty good friend uh, who played on the basketball team, uh, Ed Ehlers. He and I met when we were both freshmen, and we became friends, and uh, Ehlers was one of the guys that uh, really played hard for Purdue, not only in basketball, but in football. And, uh, he, uh, he came from uh, South Bend Catholic, I think. And uh, the year that he came, for, just before the year he came to Purdue, his, his team had uh, come up second, second best in the, in the football, in the basketball state tournament. Remember, Ed. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, I think I'm running out now. <laughs> running out of things. All right. Well, it's been really wonderful talking to you this morning. I really appreciate it. Well, if you can get anything out of it, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> but I <laughs> think <laughs> may not may not seem like much, but uh, that's, that's been my life, more or less. Mm -hmm. and I thank you for this opportunity. It's really been great. There's a number of people are interested in, in what I 
would say mm -hmm. uh, the person that uh, is responsible for this called me this morning and said, uh, are you ready for the interview? Oh. <laughs> She's younger than I am, and so her mind is sharper. And so she remembered that, that be sure that you're around, and, and don't forget that interview. So uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. If you can do anything with it, uh, thank you. Sure. And let me uh, get in this little housekeeping statement. The following interview was conducted with Lewis Richard Douglas for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on July 2nd, 2013 over the phone and the interviewer was Elizabeth Wilkinson, the Processing and Public Services Archivist. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Douglas.